Hi folks, my name is Chris and I'm the artist and co-founder at Explorer Maps. My brother Greg and I produced our first map about 11 years ago, doing the map of Montana, and our list of maps has grown from one to our current tally of over 65. To learn more, please visit exploremaps.com. Welcome to The Trail Less Traveled, an adventure radio series and podcast dedicated to collecting stories and sounds from around the world in order to take you back to mankind's earliest form of entertainment, storytelling. This episode was recorded on location in Zambia in collaboration with Game Rangers International. This project was made possible due to the generous contributions of Explorer Maps. Missoula, Montana is a mecca for outdoor enthusiasts, and each week we will bring you tales of adventure from both near and far, as well as information and inspiration and a few tunes to set the mood. You can subscribe to the podcast and learn about our international outreach projects at traillesstraveled.net. And now, here's your host, international expedition guide, conservationist, and yogi, Mandela. I'm sitting in Nsongwe village with Bridget Mulindi Meyer. She is an environmentalist and humanist who was born and raised in Nsongwe village under Chief Mukuni. Bridget, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining me today on The Trail Has Traveled. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for coming and visiting us. It's really a pleasure to see you. The last time mm. I saw you was in Idaho. Yeah, yeah, the Sobek 50 reunion, I was fun. It was super fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed meeting you, and uh, I was so amazed to, to see you, you know, the action you were, you know, and you were so involved in organizing everything. I was just so impressed with you. Yeah. Well, I'll echo those words back to you. I was also mm, so impressed yeah. with you and grateful <laughs> that I knew mm. that within a few months I would be flying to Zambia and coming and seeing you here mm. at your home mm, in Nzongwe you. Village. Mm, thank you. So my first question for you mm. goes back to the clay from which you were shaped. Mm. Where did you grow up? Tell us about Nzongwe Village. Mm. Well, I was uh, born and raised in Songwe village uh, in Zambia. And Zambia is located in the southern part of Africa. It's a landlocked country. Uh, it's surrounded by Malawi to the east and uh, Tanzania to the northeast and Congo to the north, Angola to the west and to the south is Namibia and Zimbabwe. So it's a landlocked country. So I grew up here. I went to high school in Kalomo, which is a few kilometers uh, from here, and I graduated. I was the first girl from my village to graduate from high school. And then later on, I dated Bob Meyer, who was an American at that time, working as a river guide on the Zambezi River. Fell in love with him, and <laughs> we met and we dated for about five years and got married and moved to the United States. But here, Mandela, in my village, we are back now, trying to correct some of the things that us as humans have made mistakes, you know, from ignorance. Yeah, so that's what we are doing here is to restore. There is a river in Songwe called Songwe River. And uh, over the years, you know, uh, it's gone dry, you know, due to human activity, you know, cutting of the trees, animal grazing and drinking and poor construction, I would say. You know, they uh, they had built a dam in the 70s, which is upstream, and it's broken down and it's eroding all the clay and it's dumping it on the river. So we have to remove the clay and then we have to restore the vegetation that's been lost due to human activity, replanting and desilting. Yeah, so that's what we are doing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your childhood and your parents and what life was like growing up. Well, back then, we lived in homes that my dad built out of wood poles with thatched roof. And then my mom would mud the walls out of clay and she would use different colors. You know, she would use the reds and it's a different clay that would 
dig out from a different area within our village. And then she would mix it with water and then she would stick it between the paws and then she would go around and redo it until it's thick and it becomes the wall that would protect us from the cold and rainfall. That's how it was. And so we had several homes within the complex separate structures and so the girls we shared our house of our own and with my sisters and then the boys also had their own house you know these would be outside structures it was not enclosed just separate buildings and so we would sleep in there and we grew our own food we had gardens that we grew and then we had also seasonal gardens that we planted when the rainfall came and we grew crops like sorghum, uh, maize, which is our staple crop and we use the flour of maize and sorghum to make shima which is our staple food. It's a porridge and then we cook it and we eat it with vegetable or meats too. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we lived. We were very self-sustainable because we grew our own food and we dug our own wells near the river and that's where we drew water to drink and bathe and wash. Mm -hmm. So I used to walk to school on foot about a kilometer away from here. And then when I went to fifth and sixth grade, and that school was by the Victoria Falls. So we walked to the Victoria Falls to attend fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. And then I would come home and help out my mom, you know, to clean dishes and cook food and shima. And, and then we would go in the bush to fetch wood that we would use to make fire to cook food. Everything was uh, very manual. When you were walking to school, did you encounter wildlife ever? Sometimes we did, but mostly at that time we encountered mostly baboons and they would chase us. So we always moved with sticks and stones. Then when they tried to aggress, because we used to carry food with us to go and eat because it was a long distance. Mm -hmm. So we had these little containers and so the baboons, we got accustomed to the containers. They knew it was food, so they tried to attack us so they could get our food. And then we would be there, we would leave home, the village, we would leave the village around 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and then we would come back around 17 hours. Mm -hmm. So pretty much it was a whole day long from walking and also being in class and then walking back home. Yeah, because yeah, it used to be like 40 minutes walk and 40 minutes back, mm -hmm. sometimes longer. But we used to like to run. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm. I did have a baboon come and steal a banana peel from me at Victoria Falls oh. yesterday. Bob was there, he saw. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about this ecosystem that we're in, because just not too far from where we are right now, we have Musio Tunya, yes. the smoke that thunders Victoria Falls. Yes. And then I actually hiked out of the Zambezi Gorge, mm -hmm. right below the rapid number 10, to oh. come to your house today. Oh, wow. And so just kind of like telling the the global listener a little bit more about mm -hmm. this ecosystem that you're in? Mm -hmm. For me, it's of great concern to try to restore this Songwe River mm -hmm. and the systems along the Batoka Gorge, which is where the Victoria Falls is and the Zambezi River. Particularly this river, this is a tributary to the Zambezi River. Mm -hmm. And so the Zambezi River is the main water body. And that water body depends on these tributaries mm -hmm. for nourishment, for the aquatic habitat, because the main river does not have, it cannot supply uh, enough of that nutrition for the fish. So the vegetation is very critical. The trees that have been cut, we need to restore because when the leaves drop, when the rainfall comes, the leaves get wet and they decompose and they get washed in the main river mm -hmm. and that organic matter is the source for food for the fish mm -hmm. and also it helps to sustain the river itself mm -hmm. from that organic matter because there are other plants apart from just aquatic life there are other plants under the riverbed that also is part of the ecosystem of the river mm -hmm. so we need to keep supplementing that mm -hmm. so when we cut the trees we don't supplement it becomes very detrimental mm -hmm. and it's 
contributes to a lot of very negative effects to the environment. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do my part in my village to try to reverse that negative activity that we've done out of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, with the tradition, people if, think trees are, are grown by God. So trying to educate the community that we can replant. Uh, when we came here, the, we were told mango trees don't grow here because it's very rocky. Mm -hmm. And so we've planted all oh, these are mango trees. And now everybody is very inspired. Everybody's trying to plant mango trees. Uh, because then they've realized it was just a myth. They actually grow even in the rocky areas. Yeah, yeah so this ecosystem around, we are trying to bring the entire community on board mm -hmm. because this is very crucial and we are running out of time. It's very, very hot. We never experienced this heat when I was young. Let's talk about that. I would love if you could be willing to just talk to us a little bit about how it once was and what you've noticed mm -hmm. in the changes during your lifetime in Nsongwe village. Yeah. Well, for instance, when I was young, we had a lot of rainfall. We used to grow a lot of food. Indoors, we would have about four shelters just to store our harvest. Right now, we have none. And when I was young, we used to grow a lot of food such that we used to spend all our weekends in the fields. We used to camp in the fields just to harvest and to protect our, our harvest. When I tell my nieces and nephews now, they cannot believe it because they've never seen it. And Fridays from school, we would change our uniforms and we would go in the fields, which is about a kilometer from here. And literally all we took with us was pots, and we cooked groundnuts. We cooked corn from the field. And we never even carried water with us. We had watermelons. They were just everywhere. So when you were thirsty, you just went and crushed. We didn't even, we just crushed one against the rock and your thirst was gone. And all of this is gone now. We barely grow enough. And I'm not just taking myself. I'm taking to the rest of the community. People are not growing enough to sustain their families. There is more hunger now. Some families don't even get three meals a day because we are unable to grow enough food to eat because there's no rainfall. When I was young, starting from October 15th, that was the beginning of our rainy season. And now... The rainy season is in December. And once it starts, and when people are just ready now to, to go and plant, the rains are gone. It has become very dangerous for the communities because what used to sustain them, what used to provide for them, the rainfall, so they can grow their, it's gone, it's, it's no longer the same, it's changed. It's hot now, very, very hot. We've lost a lot of livestock this year from the heat and from the wildfires. We don't know, you know, it's people that are causing the, the wildfires or they are st starting out from extensive dry heat. But then the grass that the cows depend on is gone. And then there's no rainfall enough to maintain the river so that the cows can drink from it's a big difference. I am not talking because it's a movement or it's something I've learned about. I have lived it. I've seen it. I've seen this river. This used to be a big river. It's about eight kilometers. And the entire river where there is water is just this part where you are seeing. From the entire river. And because here we've been planting and we've maintained that canopy to provide with a shade and to provide the ground because the entire ground is now dehydrated. There is no cover. There is no ground cover. There is no canopy. It's just exposed to the extensive heat. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. We have a problem. Yeah, it's a big problem. Bridget, what would you say to someone who brushes it off and says the climate has always been changing? I have lived I have seen the changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say. To, I don't even know that there are people that are thinking like that. Mm -hmm. 
I would say that they need to take a, a second look. Maybe they need to visit places like Songwe mm -hmm. and talk to the community and mm -hmm. see how the community have been affected negatively. You know how people uh, are no longer growing the crops that they used to grow, the traditional crops, even trees, their medicinal trees that used to supply them with medicines, they are all gone. Mm -hmm. And the water, for us, water is so important mm -hmm. in our community. It's, we use water for healing, river water is used for healing. Now it's gone, what do we do? We are going alternatively. Mm -hmm. That's not our, what our culture calls for. It's calls for nature, to be with nature and to use what is found from nature for healing, mm -hmm. for food. For us, it's affecting us. That's the voice of Bridget Mulindi Meyer, and we are speaking to her in Songwe village. Bridget, it's now time for a song. Is there a song that you can share with us that reminds you of perhaps your early childhood? Yeah. Well, the one I would like to share with you is a song that we usually sing to call upon our spirits of the ancestors to bring about the clouds, the clouds that will bring rain, because we need the rain. We have no water. So that's the song I would like to sing to you, and it's called Mezi Mezi. Mezi Mezi Mulenaka, come so nashwa Mulenaka. Mezi Mezi Mulenaka, come so nashwa Mulenaka. Ea, come dingili dingili, ea, come take la mema. Ea, come dingili dingili, ea, come take la mema. Mezi mezi mulena ka kam so na shwa mulena ka Mezi mezi mulena ka kam so na shwa mulena ka Eya kam dingili dingili eya kam tekula mema eya kam dingili dingili eya kam tekula mema Right now I smell the baked soil from the heat and I hear the birds from one tree to another, from the uh, riparian trees, from the hydrophilic trees. They like to build their homes in these trees because they also like that moisture and we are surrounded with all these trees and mango trees and acacias in the black soil and the birds they don't stop they are talking and maybe they are communicating with us I don't know but they just non-stop and there's a nice breeze coming from these trees some of the trees are now starting to flower and there are seeds everywhere that pop up from the acacias and we pick the seeds up and then we are planting them also. Right now we are sur surrounded by the cycle of life. You know, the trees, the branches break and they rot and the most stuff grow from that. They provide nutrition to the earth and there is another life, other trees and other bushes, grasses grow from that. So, and we are surrounded by this silence, you know, from the trees and from the coolness. Maybe 500 yards from here, it's very hot. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we are under this shade and this shelter from the sun. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. There are some flowers blooming here right now. You said I came at a good time. Yeah, those flowers, they are called Scadoxas multiflora. And when I was little, our traditional name of that plant is called Wanamu Simbi Simbi, which means for the girls. And then there is another one called Wanamu Loba Loba for the boys. So the boys used to get that plant and would run behind us. Mm -hmm. So if you look back, 
and then the boy would give you that flower and then which means maybe in the future you can be together <laughs> so that's the tradition of that plant and it only blooms it will stay with the flowers for 10 days mm -hmm. then it produces these beautiful big green leaves and then those would die down after a month or so so it's you've come at the right time uh, because yesterday they had not even popped up mm -hmm. and then this morning when i came back from the village I came because I was trying to study them and measure the crown and the height. Mm -hmm. And I just saw it was all red. It was just an amazing, you know, the, the photosynthesis that happened just overnight. Bridget, we've talked about trees a couple of times now. I'd like to dive into that issue because I've been recording interviews around Zambia for a month now. And this common theme keeps coming up. Yeah, deforestation is a very sad story in Zambia. And it's a new phenomenon. Because when I was growing up, I told you, we used to go in the bush and we would collect all these old dead trees and branches mm -hmm. to, that we use for cooking. And now there's this high demand of charcoal where men go out and they take down just big and live trees. We used to collect dead branches and now they cut the whole entire tree that probably has been there before they were born and so they cut it and then they 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 burn to make charcoal which the urban area now urban movement they use it for cooking and it's a, a much inexpensive method of you know cooking it's an alternative to electricity particularly during covid when many people were laid off from work and the government had nothing in place for these people. And so people cut back on electricity because that's expensive. Then in the village, people were unemployed. So they took to the forest to cut the trees and then brought back to the city to sell. Deforestation is becoming a big issue. It's because people have cut and they are not replacing and they have not seen a need to replace. Like I mentioned in the beginning, traditionally, like in my village, planting of trees, is, it's an unusual because people think trees were there before we were born. Trees were planted by God. It's a gift from God. But then what they don't realize and what we are trying to teach them is we have misused that gift. So maybe we need to replant. But a lot of areas have been cut some maybe for new fields, new home construction, new hotels. It's a problem here. And that also has affected wildlife. The first time I saw an elephant is when I dated Bob. So I was 20, 22 years old. But today, a five-year-old knows an elephant because they are coming in the villages because we have cut a lot of trees, some which was a source of food for the elephants. And so now they have to cover long distances to look for food. So as a result, you know, they are coming in the residential area. They are looking for food because where they used to get food is no longer there. People have cut trees, they've burnt. So it's a problem and the government needs to do a lot of sensitizing education. Uh, we have been planting here and the government has been here to see what we are doing. And they have shown interest in what they would like to do, you know, because they've walked this river. It's completely dry, the other part. So they want to replicate what is here for the entire seven kilometers of the river stream. I think they've also seen the devastation and there is a call also for the other communities like international community because I think like water or vegetation trees is one thing that we all share in common. It's one thing that we are all connected to. You know, the water we drink, the air we breathe. So it's very crucial that we do something about the deforestation. It's massive here, particularly during COVID. It's just it was amazing to see, you know, many trees were cut. Yeah. It's a sad history of our country. Bridget, I'd like to transition to some other forms of human activity that you have observed and ways in which you're working in your community 
to help preserve wildlife and wild places for the next generation. For us, what we are trying to do, we want to restore the river, Songwe River, mm -hmm. uh, by planting grasses and by planting trees and also desilting in some areas where we've had human activity where there was a dam upstream that was poorly constructed mm -hmm. and it's breached now and sent all this clay mm -hmm. and dumped it along the river. So to me, when I was little, we used to swim in this river. We used to fish in this river. I remember my mom one time I came home and I had a, a big container. It was full of fish. And she was so proud of me and she cleaned the fish and that's what we had for supper, the entire family. Mm -hmm. But now that's gone. We no longer have fish in the river. We no longer have water. We no longer have frogs. We no longer have nothing in the river. So for me, I want to continue restoring the ecology along the river. I want to plant. I want to continue with that. Plant grasses so that it's like when I was little. Because it's no longer like that. So I don't have scientific background on restoration, but what I've done is just to put back what was there, mm -hmm. what I used to see. And it seems that is translated into scientific background and it's, it's made a lot of people interested because it's brought back the water. Mm -hmm. And then this water now, it's here right, year round. We didn't have water year round. So that's what I would like to do. And that's what I would love to leave for the next generation. I want them, the girls and the boys, to enjoy what I did, swimming in the river mm -hmm. and fishing from the river. Beautiful. Mm. Bridget, we are here in, in Songwe village. This is where you were born and raised. Mm. You ended up leaving and going to boarding school and living in the U.S. But I'd like to share some information and inspiration about your village with the listener. I'll go back to maybe my family. My father had three wives and my mom was the first wife. And so they didn't have any education at all. So my father was very interested that I attend education because and particularly my mom, she was married at a young age and so she was determined that I had attained an education and so as a result from her support, I was the first girl in my entire village to go to boarding school and to graduate from high school and when I got married, they were very protective of me, particularly my dad, because they didn't know Bob. It was a different, you know, culture uh, to my culture. You know, he was American, and I'm this village girl from Songwe. And so it was very important for my parents that I had their blessings. And that, so when Bob asked me if I wanted a white wedding, I said, no, I wanted to get married in a traditional way. So the traditional way involved that he comes and he meets my parents and my family and they negotiate bright price. So that's what we did. And under that big Mochenje tree, one morning we sat under that tree in front of my mom, my dad, my uncles and my aunts, in which they told Bob that uh, it was okay for him to, you know, to marry me. But, you know, I was their favorite child. So for them to have this understanding that I was getting married, you know, he needed to pay bride price. And so that was negotiated and, and then Bob paid the bride price and, you know, we had this traditional ceremony and we got married, we got their blessings. Then we moved to the United States. But in the village that I grew up here in Songwe, our leader is called a chief and and the chief is through the matriarch society. And so he is basically a chosen. There's a committee from the village that choose. You have to belong. You have to be from that family member. Uh, even if you are intelligent, or, but you don't belong from that family, you cannot become a chief. So it's chosen from family. Mm -hmm. And the current chief is my brother-in-law. So we are very, very good friends. And... I remember when they were choosing him to be a chief, he wasn't interested because he was living in Lusaka, he was a manager. So they had to go there 
they had a meeting and they decided that's the one that's going to be the chief after the previous one died. So they had to travel to Lusaka to go and get him and bring him back. And he was married to my cousin. So he accepted it and he's been a chief now for over 40 years. Yeah. So that's how the traditional governing is done here. His job is to make sure that our rituals, our ceremonies are observed at the right time, to make sure that there is rainfall for the people, that people have the land, they share the land, they grow the crops, they live on the land, and they protect the land. And we have a ceremony in which we call upon our spirits of the ancestors to bring about the rain, like the song I sang. Mm -hmm. But in that ceremony, a group of men, young, strong men, run for maybe 10 kilometers from Mukuni village to the Victoria Falls, to the Zambez River, and they run there to draw water. And they are usually dressed up in branches and leaves. They are covered in the branches and leaves. So they go to the Zambez River and they collect water in clay pots and they run with that water for another 10 kilometers to Mukuni village. And that symbolizes the leaves and the branches. They symbolize one with the earth, that the earth you are there to protect the earth. And then the water that brings about the rain the water that makes us survive. They make our animals survive. They make our crops survive. They make the human beings survive. So it's very important to protect all of that. But over the course, that has been disturbed. And so we want to correct that because that's part of our culture mm -hmm. and that's part of our life. So that's why for me, this is a very a passionate project for me because that's my culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's the voice of Bridget Mulindi Meyer. She is an environmentalist and a humanist who was born and raised in Nsongwe village, and that is where we are sitting today in her home in the village near the Zambezi River. Bridget, it's now time for another song, and I'm okay. delighted because you've got the most beautiful voice. Well, thank you. What song comes to mind that you'd like to share with us right now? The one I would like to share you with. It's a song about harvesting, growing, and then after you grow the crops, you anticipate harvesting. And of course now with this lack of rainfall, it's a problem, but we always grow. And then when we grow our crops, we anticipate the harvesting. So this song is about a woman that is calling for somebody to bring her child because she's worked enough and she's grown all her vegetables and now she just wants her baby and just sit back and look forward to our crops to grow and harvest usually we dance with this song you can you can stand up and dance okay yeah, i can move the microphone <laughs> okay <laughs> Kali mama mundu ye nde tela mwanangu bonse bali mabala kotoka nde tela mwanangu bonse bali mabala kotoka nde tela mwanangu peke peke tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene peke peke tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene kali mama undu ye nde tela mwanangu kali mama undu ye nde tela Manangu, won sebali mabala kotoka nde tela manangu, won sebali mabala kotoka nde tela manangu, epeke peke tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene peke peke tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene hu hu Tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene hu hu tamwa wene mwa peka maila tamwa wene Hi folks my name is Chris and I'm the artist and co-founder at Explorer Maps My brother Greg and I produced our first map about 11 years ago doing the map of Montana, and our list of maps has grown from one to our current tally of over 65. 
I've been drawing and painting for a long, long time, starting as an advertising illustrator in the 80s, back in Canada, to exhibiting wildlife and landscape oil paintings in East Africa through the 1990s. But I find that what I'm doing now with Explorer is the most rewarding project I've ever been involved with, mostly because it's a family business, and helping to grow that business gives me a real sense of purpose. We've even got our daughter Becca in on the action, making short documentaries and videos. She's just done one of Costa Rica. And my wife Ness will be finding new markets for our Explorer products when we move back to Kenya in the summer. So that'll be great fun. On the topic of connecting people in place, hopefully these maps bring back memories of great holidays and fun with family and friends. And it makes people want to get out there and connect or reconnect with these places. Do I have a favorite map? I definitely do not have a favorite map. They're all my favorites because they're like my children. I love them all equally. How's that for a diplomatic answer? Anyway, thanks for listening. To learn more, please visit exploremaps.com. And be sure to use promo code MANDELA for a discount. We are here in Nsongwe village speaking with Bridget Meyer, Bridget Mulindi Meyer, and Bridget is an environmentalist and a humanist. She grew up in this village, we're here at her home, and Bridget, I would like to talk to you now about your experience going to the United States and seeing snow for the first time. <laughs> oh, it was very interesting, you know, because the culture, I had a cultural shock. Things were very fast for me getting to United States and my first time to fly ever. I thought, because when I was little, we would see the airplanes in the sky, but for some reason I thought there was a road there. I didn't imagine how something of that size could just fly without leaning on something. And I was a bit anxious, you know, flying mm -hmm. in a long distance like that. And so when I arrived, my husband was from Minnesota. We went to Minnesota. And so when I arrived there, people were very curious ab about me and they were telling me how beautiful Minnesota was. And they were telling me how you wake up in the morning and the ground was all beautiful and it was white with snow. That was in the 90s. In that time, the United States had sent soldiers to Iraq. There was the Iraq war. So I was reading about it, what was going on. And so one, mo one morning we lived in an apartment building and it was a Saturday, and Saturday was always very busy. You know, families going to the laundry room to do their laundry, and they, you know, you could hear the kids run across our door. And so I had just finished reading the Saturday paper, and then I looked. We had a big glass sliding door, and I was looking through the glass sliding door, and I saw little things falling. And I tell you, even today, when I think about it, I still get that feeling. I was very scared. And Bob was not there. I was alone. And so one of the things that I, you know, he had told me in case of emergency, you can dial 911. And so I saw these little things. And the first thing that came to my mind was the Iraq war and Saddam Hussein was going to use nuclear weapons to United States if the soldiers didn't withdraw. And so I was curious, what was the nuclear weapon? They said it was gas. You know, you breathe it and then you die. And so I was looking through the sliding door and I had just finished reading the paper and he did talk about, you know, Saddam Hussein using nuclear and chemical weapons to United States if the American soldiers did not withdraw from the Gulf. And so immediately I thought, there is the chemical weapon. So I called 911 and the, the guy answered and, uh, can we help you? I said, yes, I am very scared. I am in my apartment. I'm looking through the glass door and I'm seeing little things that are falling. Could that be chemical weapons? And the guy said, what? Chemical weapons? Where are you? I said, I'm in my apartment. I'm in Harbor Lane Apartments. And so they, he, they put me on hold and he came back on the line. He goes, ma'am, 
can you just stay in your apartment and not go out because we are not sure what you are talking about? And I said, you know, they are now falling. There are a lot of them. They are falling. And so they hang up on me. And Mandela, I was so scared. And I opened, I heard some people, I heard noises in the hallway and I opened the door and I asked, it was this man and this child, I said, Sir, can I ask you, I'm seeing little things that are falling. Do you know anything about this? Because I was just reading about Saddam Hussein using chemical weapons. And he looked at me and said, well, they talked about snowing today. It's supposed to snow. So I said, snow, but it comes from the ground. He said, no, snow, where are you from? I, I said, I'm from Zambia. He said, madam, ma'am. Snow comes from the sky and it falls down and then it will form and then the ground will be white. And for me, you know, people told me you wake up in the morning and the ground was white and with snow. So I thought snow was formed like dew. We have dew in my country and dew is condensation and it, it just comes from the ground. And then I learned it was snow. And when Bob came back, I said, well, you, ne you needed to tell me snow came from the sky. I didn't know it came from the sky. So that was my experience, with <laughs> my first scary experience in the United States. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was really scared. Mm. Yeah. Bridget, you're also an artist. You are a dancer. You're a choreographer. You help train the Zambian dance team. You also sell baskets and run mm. your own business. Mm. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that creative side of your life. Our culture, even when we m walk, we are dancing. I don't know if you've seen some women, African women and Zambian women, when they walk carrying a bucket of water. Yeah. There's a movement, a very feminine movement, a very, it's a dance. When we cook, we dance. When we eat, we dance. We celebrate. At the funerals, we dance. In church, we dance. So dance, it's like an everyday activity. Yes, we are brought up knowing how to dance. We are brought up singing. So for me, dancing, I learned it from a young, very young age. My mom used to like to brew beer. And so when she brewed beer called Gankata, made from sorghum, you know, all the community would come to drink early in the morning. And, you know, they would get just a few sips and then the drums come out. And as a little child, you just watch everything take place. And the men would start to play the drums and the women would sing and clap. And so you were exposed at a very young age. You are exposed to clapping. You are exposed to dancing, to singing. So it becomes part of your life. Our culture involves dancing and singing. Mm -hmm. So from a young age, I have been exposed to dancing. Mm -hmm. And you dance, you just cannot help it mm -hmm. because it's part of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the voice of Bridget Mulindi Meyer. She is an environmentalist and a humanist. We're here at her home in Nsongwe village, Zambia, just about a kilometer from the Zambezi River. Bridget, the Zambezi River is near your home and it is a life force. It is beautiful. It is a means of income for many people in the community, whether they're a river guide, a porter, a kayaker, a fisherman. I'm curious, what your thoughts are in regards to the proposed Batoka Dam. If that dam were to be implemented, it would flood the rapids of the Zambezi all the way up to almost the base of Victoria Falls to rapid number three. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? How do you think that it would affect the community? I think from my point of view, it will affect them negatively because the water level is going to rise and I'm told about six meters high. Mm -hmm. So all these rapids are going to be flattened out. And so the water now is going to be permanently in the walls of the basalt rock, which does not hold water for a long, long time. So it, I don't know what that will do to the ecosystem. I'm very concerned. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of wildlife, the fauna, we have a famous Taita falcon here, and it dwells in, in the bats. We have some Batoka gorge bats, and all of these live in the crevices of the basalt rocks. 
including the tighter falcon and the birds. And now when the water level rises, means their dwelling places will be underwater. And they eat mosquitoes. They do other things in the ecosystem. So I don't know. Now we are going to alter the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And there has been no study about the effects of the rising of the water. It's mostly political motivated. And it could be detrimental to the ecosystem that we have lived for many generations. The Batoka Gorge is a natural phenomenon. And so now we want to alter it. And things that we've altered, like human activity, we've seen how negatively it has and impacted us, and the whole world as a whole. And I think this is another negative impact that's going to be imposed on the people. And I'm afraid that I'm not in favor of it. And many people in my community are not in favor of it. How would it affect the livelihood of people who rely on that river for their work or for their food? I think it, it would be negatively. The fishermen will no longer be able to fish because now they can go and access, they can go to the shoreline mm -hmm. at the bottom of the gorge and they fish and they camp there. So when the river rises, they won't have the access because it's very steep and I'm, I'm afraid we will also have a lot of accidents. Mm -hmm. We won't have the airflow that we've been getting all you know, from the gorges, you know, there is an airflow there that is caused by that vacuum, that wall. And so when you rise the water, you are going to get rid of that vacuum. So I don't know what it will do, uh, Mandela. I don't have the scientific information, but I have the indigenous intelligence that that should not happen. It should be left natural like that. So for me, I have not seen any studies. I've not seen any information that they've studied it. If it rises, this is what it will do. Mm -hmm. The only information I am getting is that when the water level rises, they will be able to generate enough electricity to sell to Zimbabwe. Zambia, we don't need it. We already have electricity. We have two hydro power stations where we are generating electricity. Enough for the whole country and enough we are already selling. So I think the international community should look into this. I think it's enough of the greedy. We don't need it. We really don't. But the impact is not good for the future and for the ecosystem. One of my favorite new words that I've learned is mano, uh, which means knowledge. Yes. And uh, I think you just brought such incredible knowledge to that issue talking about the way it could affect the airflow, to the economy, to the wildlife. But you also, you mentioned Zimbabwe. And so there are, you know, we're in Zambia right now, across the other side of the Zambezi is Zimbabwe. Yeah. I have not been able to go over to Zimbabwe yet to talk to the communities there about the dam. But I believe that the opinion is a little bit different because the economy in Zimbabwe is a lot different than Zambia. Can you yeah. reflect on what you think might be the opinion of some of the communities over on that side and their struggles for electricity. Yeah. I think they probably will be in favor because they need it. There's been a lot of um, misgovernment in Zimbabwe. That's Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. I think they were generating some of their electricity from coal, coal burning, and they have not maintained their equipment because of corruption, mm -hmm. the money that was supposed to go and maintain their equipment so that it continues generating electricity has been used in political gains, you know, corruption, political maneuvering, you know. So now some of the equipment, I think, is damaged to an extent that they will need to buy and it's costly for them to invest in new equipment. But I think something needs to be looked into into the equipment or maybe investing in the new equipment than destroying the ecosystem that benefits millions of people. The air is shared by the entire global community. And for us to alter that ecosystem to benefit corruption, I think it's not advisable. Here in Zambia, 
I've noticed there's a lot of sun. Now I'm looking down on my sunburn from mm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so can you reflect a little bit about alternative responsible renewable energy like mm. solar? I think that's a great opportunity, even for Zimbabwe as well. And I think most African governments, they are very hesitant to invest in solar because they don't have proven facts. And I think also because it's a long-term investment, some of these presidents, they want the results now when they're in power so that they can get re-elected again. I'm sorry to say that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's one of the reasons why solar is not promoted heavily here because it could be beneficial. We have all the sun, you said, in the world. And so we could leave all the rivers alone and generate electricity from solar. But I know that European countries have helped African countries to invest in solar. And because they've told the results might not come today, and so they have shied away from going forward, and the money has been used in corruption. So people have given up in those investments. But it's the, right now I think it's the biggest potential for Africa is solar. We, we just need investment in that sector. Bridget, what advice would you share with whoever's listening out there? Life advice, environmental advice, humanist advice, what advice would you share with the people listening? I, I think that uh, right now, uh, the, to my listeners, if you are in the United States, if you are in Canada, if you are in China, they should be concerned with what's going on in Africa, with what's going on in Songwe, because that affects all of us. And we need to be humane in everything that we do. We need to be humane in the environment. And we shouldn't just do our little areas, but let's look at the whole world, because the benefit is for everybody. And the land is all ours. You know, we need to share everything. We need to share the land. We need to share the air. We need to share the water. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to have time for each other. We need to love each other. It will be a much, much healthier world if we loved each other and if we had time for each other. And I think we would not even have these problems that we are going through with the human activity destroying rivers because other communities are doing much better and other communities are doing very poorly. Mm -hmm. And so the much well-to-do communities, they are not helping the, the, the disabled community. So I think as, as long as we are not going to be compassionate with each other, that gap is going to get bigger and uh, we are looking at a disastrous world and the environment. Mm -hmm. Bridget. Thank you so much for your time and energy joining me on The Trail Less Traveled. Thank you. Thank you, Mandela. You are such an inspiration to me from the day I met you. So thank you. Hey, I feel the same about you. <laughs> <laughs> we should be friends. Yes. <laughs> I'll come back to the village and help you farm and mm. run the river. And Bridget, what song would you like to end your show with? Okay. This song is about a girl that is approaching puberty. In our community, like I said, we dance. When a girl gets mature, it's a big celebration. We all dance and we sing. Mm -hmm. So the song I'm going to sing is called Ndabankolola. I'm about to become a woman. You've been listening to The Trail Less Traveled, The Trail 1033's locally harvested adventure radio series. The show premieres every Sunday night at 6 Mountain Time. You can stream it live online at trail1033.com. And if you miss the premiere, 
The show is also a podcast, available everywhere. I would like to take this moment to thank my friend, Bridget Melindy Meyer, and her husband, Bob Meyer. It was an absolute joy to visit them at their home near the Zambezi River, and I very much look forward to returning. This project was made possible due to the generous financial contributions of Explore Maps, a small family business based in Missoula, Montana. That's it for this week's adventure, my friends in Missoula and around the world. But until next week, please remember, conservation is not a spectator sport. Living in Missoula is a privilege. With privilege comes responsibility. Please get informed, get engaged, and use your voice on behalf of wildlife and wild places. If you think you're too small to make a difference, you've never spent the night with a mosquito. Now this song you dance it with a basket. Lili na mundele, lili na mundele, lili na mundele, lili na mundele. Ba mama kaba bike kuli na mundele, lili na mundele. Kaba bike kumanzi atu ba na mundele, lili na mundele. Kuli kali kali la wacha na mundele, lili na mundele, lili na mundele, lili na mundele, lili na mundele. Namundele ba mama kaba bike kuli namundele lili namundele kaba bike kumanzi atu ba namundele lili namundele kuli kayuni kadi la wacha namundele lili namundele lili namundele lili namundele lili namundele lili namundele ba mama kaba bike kuli namundele lili namundele. Kaba bike kumanzi atu ba na mundele lili na mundele kuli kayuni kali la wacha na mundele lili na mundele machi bona iya 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 pere kum pere ku machi bona iya 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 pere kum pere ku machi bona iya 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 pere kum pere ku.